Hello, today is April 20th, 2016. I'm meeting today with Mr. Raymond Rader at his home in Fort Morgan, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Ray, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was born uh, in January the 27th in 1925, and uh, south of a little town, Eustis, Nebraska, was born out there on the farm. Doctor came out there, delivered me, and and I grew up in the family of eight children. And where'd you fit in that order? Uh, I was the fourth one of the family. I had a, a the oldest one was a sister, and, and I had two brothers older than I am, and then. I had uh, uh, two brothers younger than a, than another sister, and then my youngest one was a brother. Hmm. Uh, the oldest brother got killed in Italy during World War II. Oh. He was uh, in North Africa, and hmm. then he was in Sicily. Then they had hard time getting on the shore of Italy. He went up through Italy. They took Rome. They were about 130 miles north of Rome when he, uh, they were advancing one day and run into a bunch of Germans. And uh, we heard from a colonel, he, he said that my brother offered to stay up there and kind of hold them off while the rest of them went back and dug in. And uh, that's when he got killed. Oh, boy. Then I had another brother that uh, he's just next couple younger than I am. He got involved in that Korean War, got injured real bad. He was in Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver for a long time, and carried shrapnel in his back the rest of his life. Well, your family sure has sacrificed for this country. Yeah, then my youngest brother got wound up in that Cold War over there in Europe, over in Germany, between Germany and Russia. They were always, Russia was always causing conflicts there. He was with the 4th Armored Division. Uh, I asked him one time where he was stationed over there, and he said, oh, south and west of <coughs> Frankfurt. But he said, we were hardly ever there because, he said, the Russians was always causing problems somewhere. Huh. And uh, he was in the 4th Armored Division. That's uh, the division that Elvis Presley was in. Mm -hmm. He said Elvis Presley used to sing to him now and then. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Uh. Well, getting back to your story, uh, growing up, uh, I don't know if you have much memory of it. I always like to ask your generation, but was your family uh, much affected by the Great Depression? And as well, I don't know if you were too far north, uh, and the Dust Bowl, both of those hit the, about that time. Uh, oh, yeah, the family was uh, involved in that Dust Bowl. Mm. It, was, it was quite a deal. Uh, Things got so bad that uh, there was no uh, grass left for the cattle, mm. and uh, and we didn't raise no crops for a number of years, so there was nothing to feed the hogs. So the county came out with a caterpillar and dug a big pit and run a lot of the cattle and hogs down in there and shot them and covered them up because nothing to feed them. Wow. And the government paid a little for that, but uh, uh, it was minimum. Of course, back then, 
prices and wages and all that weren't like they are now. Dad worked uh, a team and a uh, oh, it was a slip they called it, slipping dirt out of a making bar pits and putting the dirt up on the road. Him and the team all day long, he got three dollars. <laughs> this would have been uh, in the early 30s. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, those were rough old days. Uh, a lot of the people that homesteaded uh, finally just picked up and left their homesteads and went to California. Mm. Just, and the dust was so bad that. Uh, uh, mother a lot of times soaked some sheets in a wash tub of water and hung them up over the windows and doors to keep the dust out. And the dust drifted like snowbanks do today, covered up fence rows. And it was a terrible. Yeah, I don't know how you guys made it through that. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah, sometimes I wonder, you know, with a family of eight. Yeah, right. Uh, how we made it. Uh, of course, we went on what the, they call commodities. The government furnished food. It wasn't a lot, but uh, we still had some cows, and uh, we'd uh, the pasture was all dried up and gone. But in the bar pits along the road, there would be grass to grow and yet so. Us kids would herd the cows out there so they'd get something to eat. Mm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those were rough old days. Yeah. And and you went through the school system uh, there? Uh, yeah, old country schools. Uh -huh. uh, I went to two different schools. I had uh, as high as six teachers in, in the eighth grade. Uh, all through first to eighth grade. Uh, I can remember every one of them's names yet. Today. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh. Uh, I only went to the eighth grade and I really wanted to go to high school and, and we lived 10 miles from town. Uh, I was talking with my parents about it and Dad says, well, really ain't fair. Uh, none of your older brothers and your older sister, they didn't get to go. So I said, well, you're right. It wouldn't really be fair. So I only had an eighth grade education. I would have liked to, when I went in the service, I would have liked to have been in the Air Force rather than the Army. but." I didn't have no education, why they put me in the army. Didn't have no choice. Yeah, gotcha. So you finished eighth grade and just stayed and worked on the farm then? Is that. Uh... Yeah. Uh, I graduated in 40, 1940. And uh, I just worked on the farm with dad there for a few years. It was getting better in the 40s. And uh, got drafted in. 44. Well, let me back up and ask, uh, do you remember where you were and uh, do you remember hearing about Pearl Harbor? Oh, yeah. Yeah. At the time when that took place, that was in 41, mm -hmm. uh, a, a old bachelor neighbor came over and asked dad, he said, would one of the boys want to come over and stay with me? He said, that way you wouldn't have so many to feed. And dad said, if they want to go, why? So he asked me if I wanted to come stay with him, and I said, well, yeah. So I was staying with this old bachelor. He was just a neighbor to us when uh, Pearl Harbor took place. Yeah, I remember, mm. definitely. Well, you were only, what, about 16? Did you did you think at the time, did you wonder at the time if you were going to be drawn into this thing, into the war, or, or oh, what were yeah, you, remember I your was, thoughts uh, were on that? Yeah, I knew uh, there was great possibility that I was going to be drawn in because there was a lot of the neighbor kids already leaving and 
joining up in the different services. Yeah. Well, how did that work? You said you got drafted. Couldn't you have gotten a, a, a agriculture deferment to, to stay on the farm or? Uh, I got a deferment for 30 days. Oh, did you? Okay. I uh, got the, the notice that I was drafted uh, the 1st of July. And uh, Dad and the neighbor went to the county and asked if I could get a deferment for harvest 30 days during the harvest. Because mm -hmm. okay. the wheat was ready to harvest. Mm -hmm. So they granted that. So then I, I was called on January the, or on July the 31st and went to Fort Lovensworth, Kansas and uh, got inducted into the Army and from there shipped out to Camp Walters, Texas. And how was that? I mean, pretty much you, you, that your generation growing up, I mean, you never really traveled too far away from the farm or from home. And now you're, you're, you're off, uh, uh, yeah. off down to, to Texas. Was that much of a, a oh. could that coupled with the fact that you're going from civilian life into military life, how yeah. was all that transition for you? Well, that was a big, big move because I'd only been in about six counties wow. in Nebraska, and there's 93 counties in that <laughs> state. I'd only been in about six of them. Uh, then going from there down to Levensworth and from Levensworth to Camp Walters, which was about four miles from Mineral Wells, and uh, took my basic training down there. And how'd that go? How'd basic training go for you? How was that? Uh, I mean, was well, it a, was it a tra tough transition going once again going from civilian to, to into the military for you? Or? Oh, us kids were kind of tough. Do, do you think? Kid. Do you think you had uh, uh, being a farm boy? Did you think you had an edge over the city boys as far as? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were tough growing out there on that farm. Yeah. Uh, Took that basic training down there, and uh, it, the weather got to, up to 105 a oh. lot of days, <laughs> and we'd go on them 20-mile hikes, and ambulance would follow us and pick up the stragglers. Uh, oh, boy. Uh. Yeah, it was rough training. Yeah. Any, uh, any, any tinge of homesickness at all? Did you, did it, how how that work out for you? No, I never did get homesick, okay. but my oldest brother did. He he got homesick terrible. Now he had already had he already left. He'd already been off. Oh uh, yeah, he yeah. was already gone. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, during them rough years there, you know, they had what they called the CC camp. Uh huh. You remember hearing about that? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh huh. Well, my oldest brother got in there, and and then the brother just next older than I am also was in that CC camp. And uh, my oldest brother got so homesick that uh, finally dad says, well, just come on home. Uh, so he didn't finish out his two years in the CC camp, but my other brother stayed and uh, finished out his term there. Hmm. So you, you finish your, your basic at, down in Texas. Uh, take your story from there. Did you get a furlough to come home or did you move on to somewhere else from there? No. Uh, Got a furlough to come home just right before Christmas after I finished my basic down there. Was home for Christmas and I think it was the second day after Christmas. Uh, boarded the train and went to Camp Shanks, New York. And there we got all our uh, big old duffel bag with all our wear that we needed loaded on the ship and uh, get pulled out of uh, or out of the harbor there after night. I was already in bed, never did know that we was moving. And oh, is that right? Woke up the next morning, couldn't see land nowhere. <laughs> well, that, that begs the question. Here, here's a, a farm boy from Landlock, Nebraska, going to sea. How was that for you? Did you get your sea legs, or how was that, that crossing? Oh, that crossing was, was good other than... 
uh, we hit some rough weather one time, and I'd been up on deck, you know, because I didn't stay down in there because that's where you get seasick. Oh, okay. So I'd go up on deck where I'd get fresh air. And uh, I looked over the rail, and man, it was a long ways down to water. <laughs> and we hit that rough sea, and I went up on deck and went over by the handrail. You hang on that handrail, because you might otherwise wind up in the ocean. Yeah. I was hanging on that handrail, looking at well, it wasn't very far down there to water. <laughs> so there was a sailor going by there, and I said, uh, I told him about this. And he said, oh, we had to pump a bunch of water in the bottom and sink her down so it wouldn't tip over in this storm. Wow. Uh. And it was a few days after that that we got out of the storm, and I went back up on deck, and and there was a big stream of water going out at the side of that ship, about like an uh, irrigation wells pump. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Eight-inch stream of water going out. They was pumping that water out so we get up so we could go faster. Now, were you uh, by yourself or were you guys in a convoy? We was all by ourselves. Oh, really? And was there any worries about German submarines? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Whew. yeah it was just a couple of nights after that then. One night I was in bed, and it was on a Saturday night. I was in bed, and all of a sudden it just got real calm. No noise at all. They had shut the motors off. And uh, the next morning we ate breakfast, and then we was going to have a, a service. There was a chaplain on board. We was going to have service in the mess hall. And the chaplain says, I guess we need to pray a little harder. We had a German submarine on our tail last night. Oh, boy. <laughs> wow. But uh, we waited quite a while that day, and then finally they fired the motors back up, and we took off again. Uh. We were nine. This was the U.S. West Point. It had been a tourist ship before, where they take people on uh -huh. tours. Uh -huh. But the Army took it over, made a troop, troop transport down. out of it, had these bunks on the side of the walls. You could just barely get in there between the other bunk. There about six of them on the wall. Uh, wow. There was uh, 15,000 of us on that 15, ship. 15,000. It's a big ship. Wow. What, what would you do to pass the time uh, crossing a, on the oh, crossroad? Oh, played cards and... And most of the guys couldn't get them to do nothing because they were laying down there in their bed, uh, seasick, uh. throwing up and moaning and groaning. And I'd say, come on, let's go up on deck and get some fresh air. And, no, I'm not going to move. They just lay down there. Uh, oh, boy. And when they came up to eat, they'd throw up on the table. <laughs> <laughs> These tables had the sides on them. Uh -huh. And they had the holes. And after everybody got through, well, they uh, come with big holes and just wash everything. And they'd go down them holes and clean it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't real pleasant. Yeah. But we were nine days going from New York to Liverpool. Wow. Uh, England. And then we got on a, a train. They took us down to Southampton. Now, what, what was your status at this time? Were you already in a unit, or were you going over as a replacement? I was going over as a replacement. Okay, okay. All of us on there was okay. going over as replacements. Okay. And this is already, uh, uh, the Battle of Bulge just probably finished up, or was that? Uh... I got to my outfit about three days before they said the Battle of the Bulge was over. Oh, okay, yeah, so you're right so in the I thick of... I just barely got in on it. Okay, in the thick of that then. Anyway, uh, we started across the English Channel and... Uh, how, how, long, how long did you stay in England once you... Oh, I just got there one evening. Oh, so you didn't stay in train there. You went almost oh, no. right away over to the continent then. Yeah, we okay. already had our training, so we went down across England on the train. 
We were not there very long. Oh, okay. Went to Southampton and then they loaded us on an LST, mm -hmm. if you know what that, that is. flat bottom boat there. That's uh, mostly for hauling big material, right. tanks mm -hmm. and trucks and jeeps and stuff. They just opened them big doors on the side and run us in there like a herd of cattle and shut the doors. <laughs> oh, man. We started across that English Channel. And got about halfway across and they anchored. Uh, I asked some of them sailors, so I said, why are we just sitting here? Well, they didn't know. Took somebody, like an officer that, that knew what was going on. And anyway, we were there three days and three nights. It was just like being in a big drum. And waves would come in on the side and you just echo in there. Everybody was seasick, and, and including me. Then. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And, uh, Anyway, finally, after three days and three nights, we took off and, and we went toward Le Havre, France. Uh, they couldn't get into harbors there, so we had to anchor way out, quite a ways out, because there was a lot of wreckage there yet in the harbor. Oh, was it? Yeah. And uh, there was a bunch of black soldiers. Uh, running these ducks and they was when we first got there they were coming out there unloading uh, food and ammunition fuel anyway when we got there well then they come over there and hauled us in and they just barely got in on land and somebody hollered scatter scatter <laughs> Everybody was running different directions. Well, a lot of that was already bombed out, but it was mostly stone and brick houses and that. And I quick run, got behind a big brick wall, and a couple of fighter planes went over, and they was strafing the heck out of us, but they didn't hit anybody that I know of. Hmm. Wow. Anyway, we, uh, we loaded up on the train, in boxcars. They called them at the time 40 and 8s. 40 men and 8 horses? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, they said mules. No, mule. <laughs> and we started across France. We were three days and three nights going across France. Oh, jeez. Couldn't go too fast because they bombed out the tracks a lot of times and, and just put them back together in a hurry so they weren't real stable. Hmm. So we didn't go fast at all, but it was in January and it was cold. Or that was one of the worst winters they'd had over That's there right. for a long time. That's right. Were you were you properly dr clothed? Did they have proper uh, winter clothes for you? No, oh. just had our uniform and two of them old scratchy wool blankets. Oh. But uh, we were so crowded in there, you couldn't lay down. You just had to set up all the while. Uh, we finally got to Metz, France, and unloaded, and then they took us by uh, those army trucks to uh, Luxembourg, the town of Luxembourg in the country of Luxembourg. That's where I joined the the 5th Army Division. It's that Red Diamond Division. And we was uh, in a big old stone barn up on the outskirts of Luxembourg. It was blizzarding. About the second day, I asked the sergeant, I said, when are we going to get out of here and do something? <laughs> he said, well, there's no way you need to go out there in that blizzard. He said, well, we'll stay here till that blizzard is over with. Well, three days, the blizzard, the storm <laughs> calmed down. And we took off and headed toward uh, Bitburg, Germany. It had been bombed up. 
feel bad. But we uh, came upon a big uh, stone house uh, overlooking Pittsburgh. And uh, we fixed our breakfast, which was just K rations. And uh, then we heard a heck of a noise coming. One of our armored divisions was coming. And we thought, well, we'll get out here. We're going to see a tank battle to start with. <laughs> that was the dumbest thing we ever did. Standing out there like oh, uh, ducks in a pond. Pretty soon you're one of them. 88 oh, geez. artillery shells came in and exploded. And I got hit and one other fella got hit. I got wounded. Piece went right in my eyebrow and my right eye. Mm. And uh, of course it was bleeding right down so I hollered for the medics. Medics come looked at me and he kept messing around with it. And, and uh, Every time he'd push on it, I'd just scream like heck, because it really hurt. He thought I just maybe got grazed. But he said, well, I think maybe there's some shrapnel in there. We'll just have to send you back. And so they sent me back to Mets, and, and they removed that piece of shrapnel out of there and kept me back there a couple, three days. And I healed up real good. And so they sent me back up front. and. Uh, my outfit was quite a ways from Bitburg by now, but uh, we got in, oh, there was lots of rivers over there. We crossed lots of rivers. You, maybe you remember old Patton saying he thought the 5th Division had web feet time they got hmm. crossed, through crossing all those rivers. Well, I don't remember a bunch of the rivers and that because I started to take a, a journal, writing stuff down, and pretty soon I thought, Raider, you better take care of your butt and forget about this journal. <laughs> Pay attention to what's going on. So I just quit that so I don't remember a lot of those rivers or towns. Anyway, we got to to where we was trying to take Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, they were shooting at us with anti-aircraft guns, which is wicked stuff. Those 88s? Right? Those, yeah. uh, they were, uh, can't think what they called them now, the calibers. Anyway, the, when they hit, they explode. And uh, they just drove us back, we couldn't, bunch of our guys got wounded and uh, so we tried to take it the next day. Same thing, they just drove us off. But we couldn't see where they had the guns because we was trying to take it in the daytime. So one of the officers got smart and he said, well, let's try and take it at night and then we can see the muzzle flies. So we tried to take it that night and we found out where they had them, but they drove us off even at night. But we called in the Air Force, they came in and bombed them suckers down, but you know where they had those guns? Uh, a lot of the old factories had closed down, you know, and they had these big smokestacks like mm -hmm. it's out here at Pawnee, big cement smokestacks, mm -hmm. and they built them anti-aircraft guns up in there. Hmm. So they had to drop on us they could see everything that was going on. But we called in the Air Force, they came and bombed her down, and then we went in and took the town. <laughs> and uh, this was getting way long in the war, you know, where a lot of those German soldiers was getting tired of all this fighting, so they was discharging their uniforms and putting on civilian clothes. So we had to go around from house to house, and if they didn't have this card with a certain number on it, well, we had to take them prisoners. 
So he was doing that for a couple, three days there, and Patton came up there, and he says to, he got right there with uh, my company, which was D Company, uh, he says, I'm going to move my headquarters up here, and he said, I, we had four machine guns in D Company. He said, I want one of them machine guns at each corner of the block where my headquarters is going to be. I thought, oh, man, going to get some good duty here for a while. <laughs> but that only lasted about three, four days. Oh, is that right? And uh, Marshall was had, he was a uh, British general uh -huh. with the First Army. They were up in the northern part of Germany. And he called Patton and he said, uh, we have a whole bunch of Germans surrounded up here. And he said, I'm afraid they're going to break out. And he said, I need some help. And so Patton told us guys with the 5th Division, he said, uh, especially us with who were guarding him, he says, I don't need nobody guarding me. He said, take your machine guns and go with the rest of your outfit. Go up there and help Marshall out. So we headed up there one day and got there just in the evening and had a rugged battle. And the next morning they surrendered. There was, I don't know how many people was in a German division, but there was three divisions of German, uh, Germans that surrendered all at one time there. So they had to coming out in a double convoy of German soldiers and a double convoy of us going in on each side. Every now and then they'd stop us and we'd have to search all them German soldiers because they didn't throw their pistols and knives and stuff down. Mm. So we had to take that off of them. And uh, this old SS officer I was shaking him down and he had a little 25 automatic. I was taking that off of him and he kept saying something to me and I, of course I couldn't understand him, he was German. And so we had a kid that could talk German. I said, hey Steve, come over here. I wanna have you talk to this Kraut over here. <laughs> we called him German's Kraut. Yes. And uh, so he talked to him a little while and then he said to me, he said, Oh, his wife gave that to him one time for a birthday present. He wants to know if he could keep it. So I left him, looked down the end of my rifle barrel, motion for him to get on down the road. <laughs> yeah. We went from there, across some more rivers. And, and what was, you remember what that town was where Hitler gave so many of his big speeches? Nuremberg? Nuremberg. Uh -huh. Yeah, we went, captured Nuremberg, took a bunch of prisoners, <coughs> then we went on down the line and uh, uh, let me think a minute. Uh, his big hideout, what was it they called that? Yeah, the Eagle's Nest? Yeah, up in the mountain. Uh -huh. We took that over. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Went in there, and the uh, outfit had already been there and captured it. So we didn't have to really capture it, but we we looked it over. The uh, uh, captain left us look, look around there, and in this one big room, there was one of them big swastika flags hanging up there, and I jerked that sucker down. <laughs> Watered it up, and boy, this is one other kid says, I want that, I'm gonna take that home. So I just gave it to him, I wasn't gonna, I was already loaded down with weapons and oh, yeah. ammunition for the machine gun and all that. So anyway, we messed around there for a while, and then we went on, crossed some more rivers, fought some more battles. And, uh, we got to the Siegfried line where they had all those 
pillboxes. Mm -hmm. And we were always supposed to just shoot harassing fire, you know, so the riflemen could crawl up. So you're a machine gunner? I'm a machine gunner. Okay. And uh, I wasn't the gunner at the time. I was just an ammunition bearer. Gotcha. Because that machine gun will shoot a lot of ammunition, so right. had three ammunition bearers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, we sent, uh, I think it was B Company. They tried to cross that river one night, and the Germans just shot them pontoon boats out from under them. They all went down the river and drowned. Hmm. Water was cold. They probably didn't live. 20, 30 minutes, mm. and they were gone. So they sent C Company the next night, and <laughs> I don't know why they did such a thing like that, but they just, they all went down the river and drowned too. So we was over here on, on the bank, supposed to be shooting harassing fire, but <laughs> couldn't, uh, the little 30 caliber, you couldn't, do any good shooting at that pillbox because they had a little slit in there where their mm -hmm. guns went out. Anyway, they brought up a tank and he set up on the, clear up on top of the, we were down a ways on the bank. Those were deep rivers. They were down a long ways. Anyway, that, that tank got up there and he was right above where we were. And he started shooting at that pillbox. And it took uh, 23 rounds before he got through that wall of that pillbox. Wow. wow. And uh, every now and then the, the artillery would kind of get in on him. So he'd go down the river a ways and then shoot. He'd have to shoot at an angle. And sometimes he'd go up the river a ways and shoot at an angle. Then he'd come back down there right ahead up above us, but it took that long to get through that pillbox. Hmm. So that night we loaded up and we went across the river and got over there and there was one soldier in there and they were just like homes in there. They had bunks in there and they had big uh, cupboards with all kinds of canned food and stuff in them. And, uh, we got in there and there was one wounded wounded soldier in the bed in there and there was one dead laying out back and the rest of them, I guess, all got away. But uh, we went to eating some of that food. It was good. It was all canned stuff. And uh, it wasn't long after that the orders came down from headquarters to quit eating that food because the Germans were poisoned. I heard that, yeah. I was yeah. going to just ask you that. They had yeah. little syringes, oh. like you get a shot, and they stick it in there and put some poison in, and then they'd wax, wax that hole shut, and uh, boy, you just grabbed it and you didn't notice that being waxed, and so some of the guys died because wow. they was eating that stuff and they quick put out that headquarters for us to quit eating it. Hmm. But uh, they did all kinds of things to, to kill us off and wound us. They would uh, take what they call piano wire, which is real hard wire, and they'd string it across from one tree to another tree uh, across the road, and uh, if we had the machine gun mounted on the Jeep, you had to have the windshield down. Right, right. And uh, so you'd go along there and that wire would cut their heads off. Wow. So they had a welder, welders come and weld a big post on the front of the Jeep on the, from the bumper up so it would take care of the wire before it got to the people in the Jeep. Hmm. Uh, 
how, how was that period of time when as you're sitting here you're telling your story i mean you're out you're out in the elements most of the time you're not eating properly hygiene wasn't good you weren't getting enough sleep I mean, it seems to me any one of those things would take a man down, but you had all those coupled with the, the, the umbrella of the stress of war. How do you think you made it through that time period? Oh, it was rough. It was rough. Uh, one time back in Frankfurt, we were staying in an old bombed out hotel, and uh, two of the guys went out one night and messed up. Uh, Got this old gal, uh, sex with her. And then they wanted her to clean them up. That made her mad, so she turned them in to the our captain. So we had to go out there and line up. And she went along and picked the two out. They did it and. And I never saw those two again. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, they quit, got them out of there so they wouldn't get prosecuted. Uh, anyway, the captain says, if you guys can't behave, why, you just move out of that hotel and go out there and make your foxholes again. So, what we had to do. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, one time after we left uh, that eagle's nest, we got over into Austria, the Lower Alps, and we was hiking along there on the road one day, and the sergeant finally held us up, and he said, to, if you got a scarf or a handkerchief or something, you better tie it over your nose. He said it's 45 below zero. I don't know how he knew that, but anyway, that's what he said, so, you know, you're hiking along with all this weight on you. You're taking some pretty deep breaths. He didn't want us to freeze our lungs. Mm, wow. So, uh, but it was just real still. The air wasn't moving at all. You could hear noises sound like 100 miles away. Mm. Uh, you could hear the snow crackling when you walked on it. It was just that cold. I don't remember where we slept that night without freezing to death. I guess uh, uh, as it comes back to me now, we slept in a big snowbank. Jeez. And a snowbank, if you made your foxhole in there, it was a lot warmer than any foxhole in the ground because that snow was like an insulation. Uh. You took your raincoat after you made a big hole in their snowbank. You took your raincoat and put it down so your body heat couldn't get you wet. Then you, you took one of your blankets and covered the hole where you went in there and you covered up with the other blanket. <laughs> Those were a lot better than that foxhole in the ground. Oh, we went to, what's the capital of Austria, Prague? Uh, Vienna. Vienna. We took Vienna, had a big battle over there, and we had some other battles there. And, and this is kind of a general question, but coming from somebody that's never been in war, and never been in battle, what's that like? What I mean, I can't imagine being shot at and artillery and... What, what's going through a, a, a person's mind when you're in the thick of something like that? Well, I guess really what really helps you is you're thinking of your buddies. You're always trying to do your best, help to save your buddies. You get a bond that you don't never get nowhere else. Right, right. You really bond with those people. That must have, but it must make it tougher though when one of those those buddies is wounded or, or oh, killed. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Then uh, it uh, it's real gruesome sometimes. One time we were marching along there, and here this uh, two soldiers come with a German. No, it was three guys. 
this one guy lost it. He just went plumb eight. And you know, when people lose it a lot of times, they get real strong. Mm. So they had a rope on him, and one guy was holding on the rope, and the other guy had a gun. If it came to it, they were going to have to shoot him. Wow, wow. Because... Yeah, and you never count the close ones. Uh, like I say, when uh, we were down part of that bank of that river and the tank was shooting across at that uh, pillbox, pill uh, they shortened the range some and <laughs> the our medic, uh, there was a big cave there and we, went back in that cave a lot of times. This medic was out there looking around and, and that cell went off and, and he quit coming in the, in the cave and it was cold. So you was always stomping your feet to keep circulation. Otherwise you freeze your feet. Right, right. So uh, he was stomping around there and I, pretty soon I said, is that your dog tag you're stomping on? And, he reached down and got it and said, yeah. Of course, uh, the medics had uh, special equipment, you know, so they had a lot of pockets for their medical supplies. Anyway, he had uh, an OD shirt on and a jacket, some kind of uh, medic jacket. And then he had a big other big coat, and he had a big scarf wrapped around his neck. Anyway, uh, he kept stomping around there, which all of us was doing, and pretty soon I said, didn't you pick up that dog tag? And he said, well, yeah, well, there laid another one. You know, you had one dog tag on the big chain, and right. then you had a little chain with another dog tag on it. So we got to looking, and that a piece of shrapnel had gone by his neck so close that it cut that chain, but he didn't even have a scrap on it. Wow. Or a scratch huh. on it. And his scarf was all tore to heck and his collars and that, and he didn't even know when it happened. Wow. That stuff goes so wicked and has such sharp edges that uh, it's wicked stuff. Huh. We went from Austria into Czechoslovakia. We helped take the capital there. Then we went north from there a ways and uh, we was in a little old town there. And uh, the sergeant had come to me a couple different times before this told me to, uh, one time we'd taken this town and and uh, drove the Germans off and uh, there was another town just about four miles from there. So we got ready on the outskirts of town, dug in and got ready because we knew they were going to counterattack that night. Most of their uh, battles, they, uh, they counterattacked it at night. I don't know just why, but hmm. uh, anyway, we we drove them off that night, and so the next uh, day, the sergeant finally come to me, and he said, you get that machine gun and mount it on that Jeep, and you and that Jeep driver go up that road and see if you draw, draw any fire. Oh, geez. Oh. Uh, so I went and got it. You, you take orders or you're in bad shape. Oh. Went and got it and put it on it. I think the gunner was getting just about to go off his rocker too. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason the sergeant asked me to do it. And he knew I was kind of a daredevil anyway. <laughs> so uh, we was going up that road and I told that Jeep driver, I said, now this road has been elevated up and the bar pits are big. So I said, if we draw any fire, I said, don't you ever stop because uh, 
a moving target is harder to hit than I said, don't you ever stop. I said, if we draw fire, you just go down in that bar pit so we don't make much of a target and head on back. So we drawed some fire, so he went down in there and we went on back. And then this one other time, uh, the sergeant came to me and he said, you get that machine gun? And he said, there's a town down here about 10 miles. He said, you get that machine gun mounted on that cheap, and you and the cheap driver go down there and see if there's any German soldiers down there. <laughs> wow. So I thought, well, if there's a bunch of them down there, we're going to be in trouble. Went down there, and we just lucked out. There was no, we drove a guy around down there a little while and came on back. Oh, wow. But we wound up there, and... Like I say, uh, we we took Prague, I guess, is mm -hmm. the capital of Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. And we were north of there, ways, and and the war was over. Now, did you ever have uh, ever run into the Russians? Uh, well, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we made these people move out of their house because we were tired of living in foxholes. Uh, so we could live in their house, made them go live with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided I needed a, I had a carbine. I didn't have a, an M1 rifle. I, uh, that would be too much load for us. Right. With all that ammunition they sure. had to carry. So I had this carbine and I'd been dragging it through the snow and the mud and that. And I thought, well, I, I need to clean my gun up today. So I went out on this, it was a pretty nice day. It was getting spring. So I went out on this porch and was cleaning my rifle and a, a Czech fella come up there and tried to talk to me and of course I couldn't understand him. So I hollered at Steve again. I said, come out here and see what this Czech wants. He came out there and talked to me a little while and he, said, oh, they got a horse down here by the barn. They want to know if you'd come down there and shoot it for them so they could butcher it. Hmm. Well, this, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. But those people were hungry. They didn't have nothing to eat anymore. So I said to Steve, I said, tell him I get my gun cleaned up. I'll come down there and shoot it. So I slipped down there and shot that horse and those there was about 12 Czech people there. They come and was holding on to me, patting me on the back. And I was trying to get away from there before the MPs come and wanted <laughs> to know what shooting was going yeah, on right. down there. <laughs> anyway, that horse in the morning hit the ground and they, some of them had piled on it and was starting to butcher it. And uh. Anyway, we was in this house there then and one day I told my buddy, I said, let's go take a walk. So we were walking up this road, I don't know, we probably walked a mile, and here was a big lake up there. And I said to my buddy, I said, let's go fishing. <laughs> he said, what the heck are you talking about? I said, well, in that old barn out the, by that house down there where we're staying, I said, there's a bunch of German hand grenades in there. I said, let's get some of them hand grenades, come up here and go fishing. There was people up around the lake. <laughs> I think he still didn't know what I was really talking about. Uh -huh. Anyway, we went down there and got a bunch of those hand grenades and went up there. And, and of course, you have to know what to do. It's not like our hand grenades. There was a little red ball on there. You just pull that and then it's ready to go. And we called them potato mashers because uh -huh. uh -huh. they was built like what mom used to use to smash potatoes. Uh -huh. Had this wooden handle on them. So we fired a couple of them out there and then fish come to the top. Boy, these people throwed off some of them clothes, got in there and got them fish. <laughs> so then we throwed some more in there. And some of the people headed back to town. And I told Buddy, I said, I hope they ain't going back there turn us into the MPs. <laughs> and some of them other people kind of, I guess, 
f figured out what we was talking about, and they said, oh, no, no, no. So they were going back to get some of their friends, <laughs> come up there and get some fish. Uh -huh. So we finally run out of hand grenades, and they were still wanting more fish. <laughs> so I told my buddy, let's go get some more hand grenades. We went and got some more, went up there and fished some more. Those people were just tickled to death. They were hugging us and patting us on the back. Ah, uh, wow. But, uh, you know, you throw them hand grenades in there, and when they explode, it stuns the fish, and they come to the top. Right, right. But shortly then, they'll gain their momentum, and they'll take off again. So they had to get right in there and get them. That was, that was some of the more fun things. Yeah. That, now, uh, do you remember the day when they announced VE Day when the war was over? Did you guys celebrate it all? Or do you remember that day? Oh yeah, but uh, wasn't just didn't have too much to celebrate. Yeah. Uh, I think in that old bombed out hotel in Frankfurt, uh, one of the guys got a no. Uh, Motorola or uh -huh. Victrola, Victrola, yeah, the place record, uh -huh. and had a bunch of good records. He put them out in our jeep to, or out in our trailer behind the jeep, and he had it out there. And he got that out one day and had it in the house there and was playing music. And he said people heard that music and they come over there, and they talked to Steve. Wanted to know if they could come over there and have a dance that night. Uh -huh. And Steve says, well, yeah, bring them all over, come have a dance. <laughs> so they all was wearing wooden shoes back then, yes. Uh, and they wouldn't come in the house with their shoes on. They piled all, real neat, they had all their wooden shoes lined up out there. And they come in and was, I didn't dance, and my buddy didn't either. It got crowded in there, so I told my buddy, I said, let's go outside. So we went outside and we're standing there looking and I said, let's play a trick on them people. <laughs> we piled all the wooden shoes up like a straw pile. <laughs> and the joke was dang near on us because when they come out to go home, they just kicked around in there and stepped into them and away they went. <laughs> they recognized their shoes right off. Uh. Oh, yeah. But I really got in trouble there. Uh-oh. Oh, we, uh, uh, right, right the day after the war was over, I got, uh, the date was uh, corralling all the big equipment, the tanks and trucks and jeeps and stuff. So they had them in a big fenced area out there. And, and the first night I got put on guard duty. I was already so dang tired from Pat and keeping us going day and night. So I thought, oh man. But two of us were supposed to be on guard at top. One was supposed to be going one way and the other and the other way around that equipment. Well, it started to rain. And here come my buddy. And I said, well, the heck with this. I said, I'm going to get in one of these truck cabs out of the rain. So he come, crawled in there too. But uh, I just flat went to sleep right now. Just laid my head on that steering wheel and went to sleep. Mm, wow. Well, he was leery about what we were doing, so he didn't go to sleep. But finally he saw the sergeant of the guard coming looking for us with a flashlight. And I said, why in the heck didn't you wake me up so we could get out of there? He didn't know what to do. <laughs> the sergeant of the guard opened the door on his side and then asked him what we were doing in that truck. And, and he just shrugged his shoulders. He come around there and opened the door on my side and jerked me out of the ground, went rolling out there. Well, guard duty is supposed to be an honor. So we got relieved right there of guard duty, which pleased me. <laughs> but then come up to 
court procedure. Oh, geez. What they was going to punish us with. So we were supposed to, by then they had brought the kitchen up. We didn't have to eat tear rations anymore. They brought the kitchen up there, so let's put on KP for six weeks. <laughs> well, that didn't, I only was on KP about four days. And uh, the general of our division got promoted to, got another promotion, and we got a different general. Uh, and he decided he was going to make a name for himself. We were going to come right home, take six weeks of heat and jungle training, and go right to the Pacific. Oh, no. So that, that really got me out of that KP duty because we loaded up and left right away. Came home when they gave us 30 days at home. Then we was to assemble back in Camp Camel, Kentucky. That was just a camp then, but it's a fort now. Mm -hmm. And we assembled back there and we're supposed to take this six weeks of heat and jungle training. Well, we did some training there. And, and uh, in the meantime, they dropped the bomb over there. So we wasn't going to have to go. Uh, that's the only thing that kept me from having to go to oh, the Pacific. Wow. Wow. Uh, can't think now what I was. Oh, anyway, then uh, they said uh, in order for us to stay fit, we either had to keep training or we could fall out for uh, sports. So I fell out to play football. Played a lot of football over there. Was uh, in Camp Camel for about a year before I had enough time to get discharged. So I did a lot of football and and finally it got too rough for me. Uh, we was about to get a football group together, which we was whipping everybody. And then they wanted to get a group together to go to other camps and play different soldiers. And I said, I would have liked to win, but I, it was getting too rough for me. I just said, them big old boys hit you. And it, it didn't feel good. So I could, just got out. And, uh, anyway, while we were there in Camp Camel, uh, the president uh, had died, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. Teeman was, or Truman was the president. Mm -hmm. And Eisenhower had been the big five star general over there. Right. So they decided they wanted to put on a parade in Chicago. So we went up there. A bunch of us would go one day, another bunch the next day, so we didn't tie up the traffic too bad on the highway going up there. Mm. Got up there and they put us in a big old uh, airplane factory where they'd been making the Douglas aircraft. They had a bunch of them canvas beds they put out in there for us all to sleep in there. And we had to tidy up all our equipment. They got a bunch of stove blacking and black the tires on the Jeep and everything had to be pretty, you know, for these, the president and the general. Hmm. And uh, the sergeant, uh, well, I was a sergeant, but he was sergeant over us. He was going to have me go in the Jeep with the, behind the machine gun. And I thought, oh, this, this would be good. Then he come back and he said, no, he said, you got to go with your squad. Don't have nobody to keep them in line. 
I was a, I wasn't a sergeant overseas. I was just a PFC. But after we assembled in Camp Camel, Kentucky, well, the captain gave me a corporal's rating one week and sergeant's rating the next yeah. week. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I wanted to, I wanted to make staff sergeant, because as a buck sergeant, uh, we had four, four squads, four machine guns, you know, and there was a buck sergeant in charge of each squad, and then a staff sergeant was in charge of two buck sergeants, so I wanted to make buck sergeant, so I didn't have to put up with these, my squad all the time, and they was always getting into trouble, it seemed like. <laughs> uh, but he never would give me, would, never would make me staff sergeant. Hmm. So I asked the, uh, the first sergeant one day, I said, why won't the captain give me an, uh, an extra rating? He said, I don't know. He said, he's in there. Go talk to him. Gave me permission to go in and talk to him. So I went in there and talked to him. And he said, well, he said, when I see you downtown <coughs> with uh, non-coms, sergeants, and instead of those privates, he said, I'll give you a rating. I said, well, I guess it'll never happen. Because I said, I was over on the front line with some of those old boys, and I said, we're bonded. I said, I think the world of them. I'm not going to leave them. Well, he said, so, so. So then when I had uh, my two years in and went in and told him I was up to get discharged, he said, well, if you stay, I'll give you that sar uh, staff sergeant rating. I said, no, I'm ready to go home. I said, I don't think this Army life is for me. Well, he said, there's a lot of them getting discharged now. He said, you're going to have a hard time finding a job. I said, well, I said, I've always been willing to work, and I've always found a job. So I said, I, I, I'm not afraid, I'll, I'll probably find a job. But I don't, shipped out in Fort Sheridan, Illinois up there, where I got my discharge. And I got to thinking, well, maybe I might have a rough time. So I signed up in the reserves oh, yeah. for three years. <laughs> I thought maybe if I couldn't find work, I'd just... That way my time would go on. You yeah, know. right, right. Well, I was working for... Uh, so then from there you came back to Nebraska then? Yeah. Okay. Came home. Yeah. And, and that kind of the reverse question to what I asked you earlier, that how was that transition for you going from uh, civil or military life and everything you experienced over in Europe back to civilian life? Did, was there much of a transition for you? Did you have... Uh, much of an issue uh, adjusting oh, back to civilian life? Yeah, it was difficult. Uh, you'd hear noises and you'd just get you all shook up. Yeah. Did, did you have nightmares and all that? that yes, uh, some. Oh, boy. Uh, and I, I got so I uh, was always carrying a rifle in my car. And my mother said one day, Ray, you don't have to carry that rifle no more. You're not in the army. Well, it was just a habit I formed from yeah. being in the army. You, right, right. You carried that gun all the time. You didn't. If you was ever caught when you were out on bivouac, that gun sitting over again a tree or something, away from you. When we got back to camp, you had to sleep with it. That was part of your punishment. You were supposed to keep that gun with you all the time. Anyway.
way it got home and uh, I was working for a farmer and uh, that wasn't working out real good because I was only getting a hundred and twenty five dollars a month I thought man this ain't gonna never get it I loved the farmer because he was good to me but I thought uh, I'd heard about that GI Bill you know okay uh -huh. you could go to school mm -hmm. so I signed up to go get a trade of some kind and I wound up in Kansas City Missouri and a trade school. I was learning to be an electrician. And uh, graduated out of there and they got me a job with uh, Westgate Electric. Uh, they were, uh, this was in uh, 49. And they were just uh, in the Sand Hills in Nebraska. The REA was coming through there with the electric lines. Mm -hmm. So Westgate Electric was wiring the, the ranches and the farmsteads. And uh, so we were up there wiring those ranches and, and houses. And <laughs> we got in this one house one day and I was working with another fellow. He said, I'll unload some of this this wire and stuff. And he said, you go in and start cutting some holes in the wall for plugs and mm -hmm. switches. So I got right inside that kitchen door. And you're going to need switches there. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get the, we didn't have electric stuff then. Yeah, anymore. right to do anything, we had all hand to it. Oh, man. So I had this little old hand saw, and I was trying to saw a hole in the wall there and that's in the kitchen, and I couldn't get it to work worth a hoot, but I finally got it cut. Went out and told my buddy, I said, come in here. I said, I knew the dust blowed in the dirty 30s, but I didn't know it blowed the wall plumb full of dirt. And he came in there and he looked at it, he said, well, you know what this is? I said, no, I, reason I'm asking you. He said, this has been an old soddy and it's been finished on the inside and the outside. I said, oh, shoot, we're going to have a heck of a time running. Yeah. He said, well, just stay on the inside walls. Stay away from the outside walls. So that's what we've done, but to get the wires to that there by that kitchen, we had to get up on the roof and jammed our ground rod down through there and made a hole to run so we could run wires. Wow. Yeah, it was kind of rough. Anyway, uh, one week, uh, all of a sudden, I had a big red spot on my left leg. And it looked like ringworm. So I went home that weekend and went to the doctor and, oh, the uh, doctor said it's ringworm. Give me a prescription to go get some salve and put on it. And I put some salve on it and uh, went back to work and got up one morning and I had a spot coming on this other leg. I thought, oh, shoot, that's not ringworm, that's something else. So I went home again that weekend and went to a different doctor and he liked to scare me to death. He said, you get in that x-ray room and I'll be in there in a minute. Well, at that time, this was called temia. It's about like leprosy. Ooh. You get it and it just keeps eating. <clears throat> and at that time, all they had was with x you can take so many units of an x-ray machine to kill that out and I had all the units of that x-ray machine I could take when the, when we got it killed out. I asked the doctor, I said, well, where did I get that? He said, well, we don't really have any idea. I said, it might be from crawling around them attics 
them houses, said it might be from just handling copper. There went my job. Yeah. I wasn't about to go back and get that again, then they couldn't kill it out. Right. So I quit my job and I thought, well, what am I gonna do now? Uh, in the meantime, uh, my discharge had come from the from the three years that I was in the reserves. So I got my discharge. And a week later, they froze all the reserves on account of the Korean, Korean. War. Oh, so I just got out of that by the skin of my teeth. Anyway, I thought, well, I guess I ought to do something more for my country. We're still in war. So I don't know if you ever heard they used to have a big naval depot down by Hastings, Nebraska. Oh, huh. Yeah, they had a big depot down there. I went down there and applied and got a job. Uh, I was working with most of that 16-inch stuff for those big battleships. Those projectiles are 16 inches in diameter, and they're about as high as I am. And they weigh, and it kind of depends on what type they are, they weigh anywhere from 2,200 to 3,200 pounds a piece. Well, they had a building down there where they were making them, but then they take them out and stored them in those igloos. Uh, so I was working with that stuff. Uh, they handled them, uh, they called them mules, they were like forklifts to handle those projectiles. And uh, one time I was sent out there to load a whole boxcar load of them out, out of an igloo. And I'd put a row on, I had one guy helping me. He had, they had little, uh, uh, what, pallets underneath them so you could run this forklift deal underneath there and lift them. And then they had a deal strap to go around them mm -hmm. to hold them and the fellow that was working with me had to put that strap around them and I'd go out of the igloo and down the ramp and into the box car. And, and I'd put a row on one end and then they had a bunch of carpenters out there boarding them in so they had to stay. While they were doing that, I'd put a row on the other end and kept working back and forth till we got that whole box car full. So, hmm. worked down there for two years and the, the Korean War was over and they started laying a bunch of those people off. And I thought, well, this ain't much of a job anyway because didn't pay much, so I just quit. Went back home and uh, uh, by this time the folks had moved down on the valley, the Platte Valley down by Lexington, Nebraska, uh, where they have a lot of irrigation and uh, they raise a lot of alfalfa. And they had all these uh, dehydrating mills to dehydrate alfalfa. They'd go out there and cut it green, bring it in and dump it in this big hopper and it would feed mm. into a deal that would go into a big drum that had baffles in there, would take it up and then when it dropped down through, and they had this flame, gas flame, that was dehydrating that green alfalfa. Then they, some of it, they just ground it like flour. I don't know what they really used it for then, but a lot of it then they made pallets to feed to cattle, hogs, rabbits, all kinds of food. I went back there and worked in one of those hay mills, but uh, Every winter, I'd get laid off because there's no more al alfalfa wouldn't grow in the winter time, yeah. you know. So I'd get laid off, and 
one time I and my brother was playing pool in Lexington in the pool hall and a couple other fellows was in there playing pool and they finally come over there and said, why don't you come play pool with us? So we went over and was playing pool with them and that one fellow says, well, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, we got laid off from these hay mills here. He said, well, we got an oil rig down here by Elm Creek. He said, we need some more help on the rig. So we went and saw the tool pusher and <laughs> signed up and went, went. I went wait that very same night out on that oil rig. And, and I worked on oil rigs for 30 some years. Wow. Uh, that's where you retired from, from the yeah. oil industry? Yeah. Uh. Well, as we're on this part of the of the interview, talk a little bit about family. Uh, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. Oh yeah. Uh, one time we. And how did you meet Melba? We got to back up and uh, tell that story. Three. Well, I was working on this rig, and we went from Elm Creek, Nebraska. We went to North Platte, Nebraska. And we went to Mullen, Nebraska. Then we went to. Holyoke in Colorado. From Holyoke, we went to Sydney, Nebraska. That's where I met her. <laughs> and I guess we had one or two dates, and uh, we finished that hole, and we moved clear to Fort Yates, North Dakota. Ooh. Well, it was just a uh, just before the 4th of July, and I had uh, some days off for the 4th of July, so I came back to Sydney to see her. So then she got my address. So when I went back up there, she wrote me a letter every cotton picking day. <laughs> I thought, I better hang on to this gal. <laughs> That's how I met her. How long have you guys been married now? 60, be 61 years, wow. the 17th of July. Yeah. yeah, that kind of a funny story. We finished that well up in North Dakota, and they got me a job on a big old rig over in Montana. I went over there and, and a little old town of Winnet, Montana, had an old hotel there. It was no uh, motel, just an old hotel. And so I got a room in that old hotel and this woman was running it. And uh, uh, she had a couple dogs and she had this parrot. And uh, I was working nights, so I was trying to sleep in the daytime. Anyway, her grandson come to live with her that summer. And when she'd be gone, he was teaching that parrot a bunch of <laughs> dirty stuff. Uh, so one day she went down to do some shopping and I was up there trying to sleep while I was asleep. But whenever she'd leave, them dogs would get started barking, and they'd just bark and bark and bark till she got back. <laughs> and of course, that woke me up. I was just laying up there, and pretty soon I heard that parrot say, I wish you son of a bitches would shut up. Just as plain <laughs> as could be. I laid up there like to die laughing. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> it got so bad when people would come to rent a room for the night, that parrot would just <laughs> dirty stuff, so she finally had to put it in a closet <laughs> and cover it up. And I don't think she ever caught on who was teaching that parrot uh. that bad stuff. <laughs> but it was that little grandson, <laughs> little character. Uh. Yeah. 
So married 61 years. Uh, how many children do you have? I've got three kids. Three. Uh, my oldest daughter uh, graduated out of a college down at Winfield, Kansas, wasn't it? Was a, a Lutheran college. She went to college down there for two years. Anyway, she came back home and she was secretary over here at our church for a long time. And she finally met this fellow from Brush, uh, Trent Christensen. And uh, he had a few jobs and he finally went to work for an insurance company. And uh, they transferred him down to McCook, Nebraska. So they were down there and uh, he was doing real good selling that insurance. But uh, my daughter's pretty religious, so she, I think she had something to do with it. But he finally decided he wanted to go back to the seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, he was back there for four years learning to be a pastor. So he's a pastor in Julesburg of the Lutheran Church up there. Okay. And then my second daughter, she just got out of high school and and her and uh, her high school son got married and he went to work for the Union Pacific Railroad, got out of high school. Uh, so he's been with the Union Pacific Railroad ever since, and they get transferred a lot. Mm. He first was in Sydney, Nebraska, and then he went to Ogallala, Nebraska, then he went to Burns, Wyoming, then he was in Julesburg, Colorado, then he went to the Cheyenne? Huh? He went to Cheyenne? Oh yeah, to Cheyenne. And then went to... From there he went to... Nevada. Yeah, south of Elko, Nevada. And then he went to Salt Lake. And then he wound up in Salt Lake City. They've been there for what, 15 years? 14. Uh, 15. I, they've been there for a long time, but He's climbed the ladder. He's a big manager in charge of other managers. He's got a big territory over there. A lot of Utah and some of Montana and all of Idaho and Washington and Oregon oh, and wow. Northern California. They keep him on the go all the time. Hmm. He comes here to visit me. His cell phone rings every now and then. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to know how to do this or how to do that. <laughs> and my son, uh, uh, he was great when he was going to high school. He was only one of the whole class that could climb a rope. <laughs> he had a lot of strength in his arm. Uh -huh. And so he played a lot of football. He was a running back. But then uh, he, when he got through high school, uh, we had a place out here called Century. They were building homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fellow that run that uh, knew him real well because uh, his son and Alan were in high school together. So he wanted him to come out there and be a mechanic fix stuff that broke down and Alan come to me one day and he said, getting out of school like that, how am I supposed to know how to fix that stuff? And I said, well, he must have a pretty good idea that you could do it or he wouldn't be offering you that job. Alan says, I'm not going to do it. He said, I want to draw blueprints. I said, well, go. Asking him. 
So he went and asked the boss out there if he could draw footprints. And, and the boss said, well, we'll try you out. So he got to draw on blueprints and then they went <coughs> broke out there, I guess, or went under anyway. So he went over to Loveland. There was a place in Loveland they were building modulars. And so he got a job over there drawing blueprints. And, and uh, uh, I don't know if he had anybody else drawing blueprints anyway. They were getting behind, and so they told him if he knew of somebody, just, just hire somebody to help him. So he hired this gal, and, and, and they, they got to Dayton, and so he married her. She was divorced. She had three kids, and uh, so he married her, and uh, she's a real good cook. So he's not in shape like he was when he went to high school. He's got a big old pot belly on him. <laughs> hmm. And grandkids, great grandkids? Oh, yeah. Got uh, 10 grandkids. 11. 11. And seven great grandkids. Oh, I'll be darned. Huh. Well, as we start to wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any of the stories that kind of floated to the top uh, as we've been sitting here that you wanted to talk about? Melba, jump in as you've been listening. Is there anything he left out that you can remember that you'd like him to talk about, or, or do you think, by and large, we, we, we captured most of your story? Well, I wouldn't mind putting on there that I'm going to go on that honor flight yeah. here. Yeah, here next week. Uh -huh. uh, not this Sunday, but the next. That's right. Uh -huh. The first. The first day of uh -huh. May. He, he didn't tell about the little girl that he saved out of the building when it was. Huh? You didn't tell about the little girl that you saved out of the building when the bomb oh. hit it? Oh. Yeah, uh, there was many a day I didn't tell about. But well, I know, but that was a... There was one time over there. We have a, we have a picture of her. So. <laughs> we was taking this town and... Uh, I was scouting around to see if there were some soldiers that I needed to capture. And uh, there was a, most of the houses over there were stone and brick, you know, lots. Mm -hmm. uh, and this little girl had a sandbox right over there next to the house. She was in there playing in the sand. And, and I heard this uh, artillery shell go in and it has to hit something pretty hard before it'll go off. Uh, and it finally hit something in the, inside of the attic up at that house. It exploded. And those uh, roofs are just tiles, uh, like mm -hmm. bricks. Yeah. They have strips of wood on the roof, and then they just hang on there. Well, when that explosion goes off, a bunch of them come off of there and and I knew that little girl was going to get hit bad, so I quick ran over there and grabbed her and pulled her back away from there and like to scared her to death. But I turned her to where she could see when those tiles come down right in that sandbox. Oh, right. boy. She huh. was, and she turned around and looked at me and just smiled. Uh, wow. The only other thing I... When he got through with the story out there at the school, the last thing he said was, but for the grace of God, I would not be here. Wow. Well, well through the years, did, did you keep in touch with buddies you served with? Was there any sort of reunions, anything like that? No. Uh, quite a few of them had time enough when the war was over. Oh, okay. They got right out. Right. Yeah, you didn't have enough points yet. Yeah. And I didn't have enough points to get out. Gotcha. But there was a few of them that had been, uh, 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 what do you call it, reserves? Uh-huh. Uh, that I was uh, well acquainted with. But most of them stayed in when I got out. Gotcha, yeah. And uh, they went to Korea. 
So I've probably lost all of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just one of them. Just one of them that uh, lived in the... Well, up by Norfolk, Nebraska somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, when we got discharged in Chicago, and we was coming home and we got to Omaha, and uh, he says, I got a married sister lives here. He said, let's go stay with her for tonight. And then let's go to the horse races tomorrow. I didn't know much about horse races, but I thought, well, shoot, just something to do. So we stayed with his sister and went to horse races the next day. And, and uh, that next day we got on the bus and went to his, uh, I said, uh, he says, why don't you just come home with me for a few <laughs> days? So I said, okay. So we got on the bus and we went to whatever that town is. Can't think of it right now. Anyway, it was just harvest time again. Uh, they were just harvesting. That's when you uh, had, took a binder and went out there and bound them, so uh, them bundles. And then you had to sock them. So we got there just in time. His dad says, well, you got here just in time to go out and sock that grain. <laughs> so my buddy said, you know anything about socking? I said, oh, yeah, I sock grain, you bet. I know how to do it. So it was hot summertime. We'd go out there and we'd sock a while, and then that Elkhorn River runs right by there. So we'd go over and jump in the river a while and get cooled off, and we'd go back and sock some more. And one day we came in for dinner, and his mother says, so, they had put in for him a new car at the Civil Aid Theater in Pierce, Nebraska. And uh, she told, uh, his name was Clifford. She said, Clifford, your new car's in down in Pierce, Nebraska. And uh, he said, well, he said, uh, we got a little shocking out there to do yet, but we'll just go out and Sock it this afternoon, and in the morning, I and Ray will go down and get it. So we went down to Pierce to get it, and, and uh, uh, this fellow had been in the army up in the Lucent Islands. You know, they mm -hmm. fought up yeah, there right. too. Yeah. He had been up there, and his brother started this dealership in Pierce. But his brother got sick real bad, so he when he got discharged, he took over the dealership and they were just building on to it because it wasn't much of a building to start with. And, and we went down there and hell, there was just a lot of lumber laying around there and there wasn't no cars. And <laughs> Clifford asked their father, I said, well, where's my car at? He said, well, it's down by the railroad track. It come in on the railroad. Uh, he said, I got about, I don't remember if he said six or eight of them. He said, I wonder if you and your buddy would offer to drive them up here to the, to the business. <laughs> My buddy asked me, and I said, well, yeah, I'd love to drive the new cars. They were just 46 models when the 46s came out. You know, during the war, they didn't make right. any. That's right. And so... Uh, his wife would take us down there and we'd get a couple cars and drive them up there. She'd take us back down there and we'd get some more. We drove all them cars up there and then this fellow said, asked Clifford, which one do you want? He went out there and picked one of them out. And, and we went home and Clifford said to me, he said, let's go to a dance in the Was that town where we went to go to a dance? Well, not a, well not it's a town up there where Nebraska and, uh, and uh, well, Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls? Yeah, anyway, it's a town up there. Clear said, let's go up there and go to a dance tonight. I said, hell, I don't dance. <laughs> and he said, well, we. Get in on the music. I said, oh, yeah, well, let's go. 
so we went up to, went to a dance that night. <laughs> we wasn't too good getting up the next morning to go shock <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, uh. But anyway, that old boy, uh, he wouldn't sell used cars. He talked people into buying a new one. And he had all these used cars when he decided to quit selling cars. And then he had a bunch of new ones that had just come in. Anyway, it was, I guess, like two or three years after he retired that the daughters finally decided they need to sell all that stuff. And he got some fabulous prices for some of them old cars. Oh, I think I remember seeing that in the news. Yeah. 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 It was in the news all over. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, he had this, uh, have you ever heard of a Cameo? CB pickup? Oh, right. Okay. Anyway, he had this Cameo. And he kept it inside all the time. What was it? It had 14 miles on the speedometer. Uh. Anyway, it got damaged a little bit because the roof on the shed where he had it in kind of uh -huh. caved in and damaged it a little bit. That thing sold for $140,000. Uh, wow. Hmm. And he had a whole bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, they made a pot full out of them, selling all them. Uh. <clears throat> well, Ray, as we start to wind down this interview, the last question I always like to ask in these interviews, when you look back on your on your army time and war experience, did it change your life, affect your life, play a role in your life at all, or was it was it just a chapter in your life that you went through? How, how would you answer that? Oh, it changed my life from a kid to a grown up. Yeah, because like I say, I've never been but about in six counties in, in uh, Nebraska before, and then to all that traveling I did, yeah. all that fighting. I was over there six months and I was in six countries. Hmm. Patton didn't let us stop long enough to get it, our breath hardly. Uh, I could have shot him when I first got over there. Hell, I wanted to lay down and sleep yeah, once more. I'll bet. <laughs> but he said to uh, uh, soldiers that uh, don't get their sleep, they get crabby, and he said they make a better soldier. <laughs> he was kind of a rough old character, yeah. but I got to thinking about it after a while, after I'd been fighting a while, that he, he was a great soldier. You get them out and get them on the run, don't let them dig in, just keep them going. Uh. Uh, some days there toward the very last of the war, we advanced as high as 70 and 60, 60 and 70 miles. Wow. Uh. We'd load up in them trucks and they'd drive. Well, before that even, they, we'd hike all day because he didn't want us in the convoy of the trucks because the fighter planes had come straight from. So we'd hike all day and in the evening come here the trucks was. We'd load up in the trucks and drive all night. They just drive with them little cat eyes on them. Uh -huh. They had to go slow. And we'd ride all night, hike all day, ride all night, try and sleep in one of them trucks. Rough riding as they are was impossible. Wow. Uh. Hmm. Uh, but then later on when they got to uh, hiking the, with the con, we'd be in the trucks in the daytime. Uh, one time we was advancing up and and all of a sudden they stopped and they said, everybody scatter. I don't know how they knew these two fighter planes was already coming, but uh, we had uh, one truck that had uh, anti-aircraft guns on it that was in the convoy. And I don't know how that old boy knew the minute that first fighter plane come over that hill, he got him and 
And I didn't know a plane that was flying that fast could just and just into the ground, one big splash, and he was done gone, and that other old boy, he banked his fighter and got the heck on back. He didn't, yeah. uh, didn't wow. stick around to wow. get shot. Wow. But uh, like I say, I just rode up to him. That's me when I was four. That's me in some far college school. So when you started school, you started college, huh? Right. Yeah. And where are you in that picture? Down in the front. Uh, that's me right there. Okay. No, right here. That's me when I was overseas. That's old Clark Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> That's our wedding picture. That's the two of us. That's the little girl. I saved her life. She's hiding behind the jeep there, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's... Ray, tell me a little bit about your shadow box here. Oh, there's a lot in there. My military ribbons and my purple heart, and then there's some. Uh, my dog tags are in there, and my discharge, little discharge paper. And then I have a, I don't know if you're getting down toward the bottom there, there's a bunch of gifts I got from Extra Drilling Company that I worked for for 30 some years. Uh -huh. Medals I got for uh, safety awards. Very nice. And Ray, you got your uh, World War II uh, medal and your Bronze Star. Uh, what was what was the story behind uh, getting the Bronze Star? Do you remember? Uh, well, see, at the time they didn't give it to us, but uh, all of a sudden they decided everyone that taught over there was entitled to a Bronze Star. Oh, okay. So she wrote to him one day and they sent it to us. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. <laughs>